time. Timmy can't sing. And Tommy can't dance. So, so we're, we're gonna, gonna put, put some ants in their pants. Aww, and walk like a monkey. Imagination. I'm your host, Jim Fredos. I'm a sociologist who's taught at John Jay College of Criminal Justice and Yeshiva University here in New York City. Our opening clip, the torture scene, was from Clockwork Orange, a 1971 movie that's one of the most violent films in American cinema history. The scene portrays an individual graphically punished by psychiatric authorities who felt this treatment of forced rehabilitation was necessary to cure what they diagnosed as an irredeemable psychotic killer. The scene, however, reveals a deeper truth about the national emergency in America where intentional violence of all kinds exists more than any other advanced nation. At the center of this enduring and endemic violence is domination, shaming or humiliating, disrespecting and rid ridiculing people, white domination, the consequence of white America's refusal to address the long-standing record of structural roots of violence has translated, translated into a peculiar indifference to African Americans who suffer violence all out of proportion to the larger white population. Violence against black lives is part of the nation's exploited and discriminatory history, part of a social order that sees blacks as the person in the torture scene, as both deserving victims and dangerous carriers of violence, who should bear the burden and blame for the nation's an epidemic of death and destruction. Our guest today on the Radical Imagination is Elliot Curry, a Pulitzer Prize finalist author, a leading expert on the criminal legal system, and a professor of criminology, law, and society at the University of California, Irvine. He's a renowned scholar and author of many, many works on crime, juvenile delinquency, drug abuse, and social policy. His most recent book, A Peculiar Indifference, The Neglected Toll of Violence on Black America, is a deep exploration of why Black Americans are disproportionately impacted by violence. It paints a heartbreaking, disturbing picture of a public health crisis of devastating proportions. The solutions, however, to this peculiar indifference are within our reach. And the book shows the bold measures necessary to turn the tide on this national emergency. Elliot, thank you so very, very much for being on the Radical Imagination and, and for sharing uh, a lifetime of, of incredible scholarship and activism and this new book is just fascinating and uh, can't wait to get into it with you. Well, thank you, Jim. It's, it's great to be with you. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, for the academics and non-academics among us here, tell us a little about the structure of the book. Uh, you, you, you say it's the first comprehensive study to present a meta-analysis of peer-reviewed research, a study of studies. So help our, uh, our audience understand what that means. Well, you know, basically, Jim, uh, my approach to this came out of a certain kind of frustration about the fact that, you know, those of us who have been studying violence in American communities generally and, and the racial dimension of that thing uh, in particular, you know, we've been studying this for a very long time to the point where it's kind of coming out of our ears. And my frustration was that in the public discussion, such as it was, about violence in Black America, uh, it was as if none of that work had happened already. So what I wanted to do was to do the best I could to pull together a whole lot of research uh, over many decades and from several different disciplines at once, because that's another thing about this. You know, I'm a I'm a criminologist. My training was as a sociologist, but there's a lot of wonderful writing uh, and creative research being done on these issues all the time by people who are public health researchers, medical researchers, economists, and so on. So all of that stuff is out there, but most folks don't really have access to it because it, nobody had tried for a long time to 
put it into one place. So that's what I was trying to do in the book, not to, not to come up with uh, some kind of a, an original research study, but to say, hey, this is what I think we know. It's incredibly useful and, as you say, uh, covers such a broad, encompassing uh, uh, number of voices and, and, and so, so well done and documented, as we'll get into here. But, you know, um, you quote the great African-American sociologist W.E.B. Du Bois intent extensively. Uh, it, it doesn't the title itself come from his 1899 work, The Philadelphia Negro? And, and just to follow up on that, too, uh, Du Bois had so much to say about all this, of course, but uh, he, he, he remarked that black crime was rooted in a system of capitalism plus racism. Yeah. So help us try to understand that as well. And, and Du Bois' influence on, on this book. Well, Du Bois' influence on the book is enormous, and it's not just with the title um, originally, I'd wanted to title it something else, but then it occurred to me in the course of rereading the book that you mentioned by Du Bois, uh, The Philadelphia Negro, which is a remarkable book that kind of, you know, as you know, is, was neglected for generations. It came out in 1899. Really, it was in some ways light years ahead of most of the sociological research that had been done by anybody else on urban America, much less on race. Uh, at that time. Uh, but uh, towards the end of his book, uh, he's talking about the state of, of African American health in general, which was pretty dire, not just in Philadelphia, but in the United States uh, as a whole. And um, that's where that title comes from, because he said something like uh, he could think of no other time in recent human history when uh, human suffering on this scale has been treated with such a peculiar indifference. And I thought, yeah, you know, that nails it. That really nails it because I, I can't fathom myself our indifference toward the particular suffering in black communities that is represented by this extraordinary toll of violence. Uh, and so what was both inspiring and also in a certain profound way discouraging about reading this in Du Bois and going back and reading what he had to say about these issues, much of it very profound, more than 100 years ago was, hey, this is great. The guy really was on target. But how come we're still talking about this as if it's news? Right? Yeah. It's, it's, it's indifference. It's denial. It's distortion. It's all of that. Um, yeah. And maybe be helpful to get into some of the, the data, some of the figures, statistics that you, you give us here in terms of understanding the disparity between race and uh, crime and violence. And uh, I mean, it's just unbelievable documentation of what was 170,000 blacks, black people have died from through violence since uh, 2000, the year 2000. Mm -hmm. More black people die uh, from violence than diabetes, was it? stroke cancer put together i mean it's mind-boggling and as you say this we've known this for so long and it just goes on and on but try and give us a little bit of the statistical framework here or the data that you'd like to us to know well you know it, it's interesting jim because uh, i i think that this is one of these situations where uh, the book may have performed some kind of service by just sort of suggesting how massive these racial disparities really are. A couple of them actually surprised me. And again, I've been, I've been studying this for a long time, but digging into the public health data, for example. Uh, you know, in the book, I talk about uh, this public health statistic, which is called YPLL, Years of Potential Life Lost. That's the one that really got to me because you know, what happens uh, when public health researchers study this concept is they're not looking at how many people die of some problem, like, say, intentional violence or unintentional accidents or heart disease in the course of a year or a couple of years. They're talking about the amount of years of expected life that get lost when somebody is killed. And that's the thing that really staggered me in looking at these data, because uh, the average age 
of a young black man uh, dying by intentional violence uh, as of the time I wrote the book was about, you know, about 21 years old, basically. And that means that vast numbers of years of what would have been his expected lifespan get lost as a yeah. result of that. So it's measuring both uh, the, the number of people who get killed, number of black men who get killed, and also how much life is lost over time as a result of that. And that's where the differences uh, between the races become extraordinary because it's important to remember that here in the United States, white people lose a lot of years of life to violence too. Violence is something that isn't confined to, to anybody uh, in this country. Every racial group, every ethnic group suffers from the risk of being killed intentionally by somebody else in this country far more than they do in other advanced industrial societies. But then having said that, you see these stark, stark differences between blacks and whites on this measure. So that, that intentional violence turns out to be one of the very, very highest uh, reasons for the loss of years of life among the black community, even higher for black men. And that's where that figure comes from about the uh, the fact that violence takes more years of life from black men specifically than uh, diabetes and cancer and stroke combined. That's because diabetes or cancer or stroke tend to take people's lives at a later age. The, the extra tragedy of violent death in the black community is it strikes people so young on the whole. And this is tied in very much, isn't it, with James Gilligan's concept of structural violence, right? The the effects of grinding poverty uh, on one's life and the, and the uh, incredible numbers of people that, that are damaged and lose their lives as a result of that. Uh, we'll get into that more uh, as we go on. But again, as you point, this is, violence is not just endemic to, to black people, blacks and, and discussion of black on black crime. But as a society, haven't we focused more on the so-called moral character of seeing the problem as a as a moral problem within that black community rather than structural systemic material uh, violence coming from a capitalistic structure and, and white racism. Isn't that true? And and how has some of the uh, work on uh, in, in the sociology of, of race relations played on this as well. Well, I think you're certainly right that in the in the uh, public response to violence in the black community, it tends to be based on to the extent that we have a coherent public response to it at all, which is debatable, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, it does tend to be based on some kind of moralistic conception uh, that basically says, hey, you know, uh, this is the result of moral failings, personal failings, or as people increasingly talk about it, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a behavioral problem within, within the black community. Uh, but at the same time, it's important to remember that again, many people have been arguing the opposite position for a very long time. And you can, you can start it with the boys, although it happened, begins really even earlier than that. But for well over 100 years, people who have actually studied this stuff have overwhelmingly and consistently taken the position that precisely those structural forces that you're talking about are the things that are responsible uh, for these high levels of violence within these communities. Uh, I think we have sometimes, and by we, I mean, you know, sort of more or less progressive folks who who don't want to stigmatize anybody, who don't want to promote social stereotypes, there's been a fear of acknowledging uh, that uh, these high levels of violence actually exist. But if you become too scared to talk about that, uh, that you turn your head away from what really is a public health crisis, and I think also a, a moral crisis, not a moral crisis of that community, but a moral crisis of us, the larger society that we are con continuing to allow this to, to exist, these massive numbers of what I take to be needless deaths, right? Uh, so we need to talk about it, but we do need to insist that 
we see this problem not as an individualized problem, but as a structural problem. And again, the good news is that I think people have been saying that for a very, very long time. The bad news is it's been very difficult to translate that into some kind of coherent policy that says, okay, if these problems are structural, if, as you suggest, uh, the problem really is a, at the intersection between uh, extreme capitalism and a long, long history of racial subordination, then how come we don't develop policies to directly attack those things instead of doing what we do? Exactly. Why, why don't we? And let me just toss in Monaghan uh, as a sociologist who may have had an impact on that debate. Where do you place him in, in terms of the Monaghan report and um, the policy of benign neglect that Nixon also incorporated uh, as a result as, or as a reaction to the activism of the 60s and the poor people's movements uh, then and the war and poverty programs? Where, where would you place him on that spectrum? <laughs> well, when you ask where would I place uh, Moynihan, I'm, I'm tempted to say something a little uh, yeah, I, I inappropriate, know. but um, well, he's already been placed there. Yeah, yeah. Well, first that's of inappropriate, all, also. But okay, go ahead. We, yeah, yeah, we get it. Uh, I'm uh, I, I'm not entirely sure that I would I would call him a sociologist for one thing, just to draw a couple of boundaries around my own discipline, uh, but. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the difficulty with Monaghan's argument, and, you know, basically, uh, he was saying two things at once, one of which was true, the other which was not. Uh, the one thing he was saying was that there were, there were long-term impacts, destructive impacts on the Black community, particularly of uh, the persistence of long-term, very high levels of structural unemployment. That's true. Uh, he, of course, was not by any means the first to say that lots of people have said that before and many people have said it since but where he went wrong is is then saying that that damage that's created uh as a result of that long-term disadvantage now has a life of its own so if there's a kind of a culture you know a culture of pathology as he put it within uh within african-american communities which persists and will persist even if we even if we do uh, change some of those structural conditions. Mm. So that was taken, and people took the second part of, of his argument, kind of rejected the first part of the argument, uh, because nobody wanted really to deal with structural unemployment. And so it became this thing of, well, let's figure out, to, well, let's use this idea of a local subculture of violence, subculture of poverty as a way of avoiding doing very much about these problems. So. I think, unfortunately, uh, his his effect uh, over time has was really pretty destructive. Yeah, yeah, and of course, I, I know you're familiar with the debates he had with uh, my mentor Richard Cloward on this yeah. time. And I'm curious how you would put Cloward's work on particularly illegitimate opportunities in the framework of the the sociological debate well you know i'm a big fan of richard cloward's work um and and started early you know before he got involved uh with the excellent work that he and francis piven did around welfare issues uh his classic book with uh, lloyd olin delinquency and opportunity which you're referencing was an enormous influence on my own thinking and i just thought this was really great stuff and I thought at the time, and I, I still believe, that nobody has ever really seriously challenged the basic ideas that they put forward in that book. But again, it's this idea that, you know, if you have a society where everybody everybody thinks they're all supposed to make it, you know, economically and socially, but we create uh, very formidable structural barriers against their being able to do that, then, hey, guess what? You're going to have problems. You're going to have all kinds of problems. Of problems and crime is going to be is going to be one of them. Um, you know, I think those insights were brilliant. I think uh, they did a wonderful job of fusing a couple of different traditions of of criminological theory to make to make that argument. I teach it all the time 
in my classes here at UC Irvine. And I'll tell you something interesting that happens. Um, some of my students in the last few years have sort of not understood why we study these theories at all, right? Because they think we already sort of know the answers about this and we don't need to study what a bunch of old white guys had to say about, about these problems. But then once they start thinking about these theories, they say, oh yeah, yeah, that really explains it a little better than, you know, than I had understood before. And that's one that I think students really get to this day because it still fits. It still fits. And led to the sort of activism that was really making the sort of changes you've been talking about, that you talk about it in the book. And again, though, you had that backlash. The American society goes back and forth here on this yeah. politically. So uh, you have, you know, war on crime, um, uh, wars on drugs, you know, Nixon and, and, and Reagan and, and neoliberals carrying on that tradition in the face of also understanding or not dealing with that structural systemic uh, understanding. And, and so why is this so difficult for America and the political economic system to, I, going back to that question again, why is it so difficult? We, we see it in our, in the elections yesterday. Yeah. Um, I was going to mention that uh, the um, gun control uh, measures are being questioned. The, the Supreme court, New York times, uh, news bulletin just out to Minnesota, Minneapolis rejected the uh, amendment, which would have set up a social policy uh, agency to take over the police. So why, even in that so-called liberal city, you have this sort of backlash, refusal to really take it to the steps that we, that, that many of us realize we need to take. You know, it's it's a very interesting question. It's one that I, I would be uh, not telling the truth if I said that I had a nice, crisp answer for it, because I think it gets it has so many different levels. I mean, you know, partly I think we have to face the fact that we live in a country that for as long as it's existed as a country and even before and up until the present has been an extraordinarily harsh place in terms of our social policies, in terms of how we treat each other. And whether that has more to do with the fact that we, we were based on a settler colonialist model, right, and, and a slave model of society, or whether it was just based on the, on the nature of the extreme nature of the kind of capitalism we developed as a country. We prioritize uh, certain kinds of individual striving and we let people fall to the bottom uh, with the greatest of ease. You know, and yeah, we, we can never understand our social policy without keeping that, that sort of background reality in mind. You know, but particularly when you, you, you reference some of what's going on right now, including the, the failure of that Minneapolis proposition. I think there's, there's certain other things that go wrong, uh, which have to do with the way in which proponents of better policies have sometimes made arguments that don't that don't get us very far. Um, some of the stuff around policing, I think, has unfortunately fallen into that category. I think part of the problem with the Minneapolis measure and and other kinds of things uh, that uh, Democrats have sometimes or progressives have sometimes put on the table recently is that they kind of scare people without giving them a very clear notion of how this really is gonna change the structural problems underneath it. Yeah. I think some people, and I heard this from some people who, who know Minneapolis, for example, or who have lived there, who, who, who kind of said that they felt like there was not much there there. There was, a, there was a lot of talk about what was gonna change. It was gonna change the name of this institution. It was gonna be public safety, you know, uh, and it was going to be run by a commissioner and it was not going to, you know, there are a number of things that it was not going to have. What exactly it was going to do positively to address the larger structural ills of Minneapolis, 
uh, was not very clearly articulated. And I think you have to do that. You have to be, you know, I think, careful enough and bold enough to get out there with a really comprehensive vision that puts changes in policing, which of course we need, but puts those changes into a larger framework of what else are we going to do? Uh, in part because if all you talk about is diminishing the capacity of the police, and it, then what you're doing is, is making people afraid because they are, are, in my view, legitimately scared and concerned about the level of violence that exists in their communities. Uh, we need to take that into account. It's a legitimate feeling. And we need to say, okay, police reform, absolutely. Possibly very much revisioning what we mean by police, absolutely. But how do we fold that into a bigger strategy that, that says, okay, if we're not gonna do that, what are we gonna do to reduce the sense of insecurity and the reality of insecurity and violence in our communities? Put that together and you've got something powerful. You know, and if you don't put it together, then I don't think you have something powerful. I'm not so, surprised yeah, that it was. No, that's that's just a great point. And, and you're talking about perhaps taking a little bit slower pilot programs uh, to show people how this actually works. Put the mental health people out there on the streets with the police. Is that sort of what you're talking about? at least to show people concretely. That's one of the things you're saying, right? That we need to, to do it that way, to, to have people look concretely at what is happening to them in their communities. You're not just taking the police away and uh, leaving nothing, correct? Correct. I'm not right. sure it even as a matter, Jim, of slowing down so much as it is of articulating what the alternative really is going to look like, right? Yeah, um, and you know... You can move uh, quickly on that. You know, you can say, all right, here's our package. Uh, and our package is going to include things that I think many, many people agree with nowadays. Like uh, we're going to have specialized mental health teams that are really trained to deal with incidents that have to do with, uh, uh, with, with certain kinds of mental health troubles being expressed on the street. But people that deal uh, specifically with domestic violence situations, uh, traffic stuff, all kinds of things. Um, we can do better. We need to say exactly what those things are going to be. But I think focusing on that and then saying, OK, and here's what the police are going to do or whatever we call them. Here are the functions that somebody's going to have to do. Uh, some of these things we no longer want to be done by our, our regular police force. Some of them we probably do. Uh, you know, one of the things that I think, for example, that most needs to happen and that police some police departments are pretty good at doing is interfering with disrupting the illegal gun trafficking markets. Now that's something, I don't know who else is going to do that if it's not cops, right? You, right. you got to have people to get in there at, in very dangerous kinds of situations. But you talk about it as a national policy that we need. Yes. And also you can't look at uh, policies like stop and frisk and the ration and rationalizing, oh yeah, we're going to get all the guns, which is not the case, of course, it never happened, no. and, and and so on. And uh, but we here's the, the real conundrum that you're raising, the, the really profound question, which goes back to Cloward in a sense with that with mobilization for youth, which started out as an anti so called anti delinquency program, but soon it was realized that this was not about anti-delinquency but this was an anti or should be an anti-poverty program yeah and and getting into the, the the really systemic structural issues that uh you need to happen to have happen at the same time yes absolutely and i think that's what we need now and that's what i was trying to talk about in the book you need that kind of holistic view i'm i'm you know again was a fan of of, of clower's work uh, theoretically, uh, also a big fan of mobilization for youth and its early incarnation and the whole idea. That and uh, Kenneth Clark's organization that I talk about in the, in the book, the Haryu uh, organization yeah. up uh, to the north of where Cloward was doing his work. Uh, these things, I think, really had the right idea. Um, you know, leaving aside all kinds of organizational issues that developed 
the basic principle that that and it's the one you're articulating jim you know that you have to if you really want to deal with a problem like delinquency or a problem like community violence you have to get beyond those problems themselves and think of think of where they come from and think of dealing with with the whole package of the of the structural context of those problems at once right. and i think that that's that's not only right in terms of of its analysis but it's also politically right because you're going to be able to convince people a lot better with an analysis like that particularly people who actually live in communities that are hard hit by violence much more than you are by saying okay let's get rid of the cops you know? exactly exactly and, and as you and jim gullick the gilgan both argue this is public health issues that may be the way in which to frame the narrative not about punishment but public health restorative justice you know i i also had a, a question uh, from kenneth clark you quote him of course extensively uh, and one of the ones uh, the question i want to ask you is as as clark put it how are america's black ghettos internal colonies because again when we're talking about these larger structural issues we then move into areas like colonialism and imperialism so uh what did you think what do you think about clark's statement there that black ghettos uh, are in fact internal um uh, uh colonies you know i thought it was a very powerful statement and uh and one that resonated a lot. You know, one of my one of my professors, one of my mentors, uh, when I was in graduate school, was a fellow named Robert Blauner. You may know his his yeah. work. Uh, Bob wrote a book called Internal Colonialism, Colonialism and Ghetto Revolt, which is really quite a marvelous piece based on on similar ideas. You know, my own feeling is that um, it was a very powerful, a very evocative and provocative phrase. But that really what may have been going on was a little bit different from, from what the colonial analogy would suggest. It, colonies tend to be places where, you know, an occupying power comes in and extracts uh, you know, something very important from that community, it extracts labor, but most importantly, you know, natural resources of one kind or another. So you know, gold or, you know, iron or whatever it is, or, or agricultural crops. But by the time Clark was writing in the 1960s and up to the present, you could frame the real problem in some of these hardest hit black communities in America as being one of uh, they're becoming uh, um, dispensable rather than being redundant. Small, yeah, redundant communities. You know, uh, you may remember there was a book written. A, early on, I believe, in the 70s by Sidney Wilhelm, which was called Who Needs the Negro? Mm. Kind of, it was not widely known, but it had an extremely provocative view of this, which I think was, was prescient in many ways, because what he was suggesting is that the reason, I mean, the reason why, to use my own phrase, the reason why we've got such a peculiar indifference about the state of these communities in general their poverty, their unemployment, their uh, uh, levels of health problems and violence uh, has to do with the fact that they have become economically dispensable places and economically dispensable people who are living there. What that means is that in a country that's obsessed with economic production, uh, you know, at best, uh, then it's quite unsurprising that our social policy abandons those communities and puts our resources elsewhere doesn't make the investments uh, that we humanly need and we humanly understand we should be making in those communities because you know in a certain sense from some stark economic logic who cares that's where i think we are yeah 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 i as you were talking i'm thinking about how about framing it also within psychological terms yeah. In terms of need for a scapegoat to divide and conquer, I was, as you were thinking, as you were talking, I was thinking um, anti-Semitism. And the, the argument has been made that if Jews didn't exist, people would have created them. They need to have somebody to blame and, and for their own failures, et cetera, et cetera. You know, one of the things I discovered in looking really, really hard at some of the social psychological and psychological literature that we have uh, on this 
is the extraordinary role of, of what I think you could capsulize as hopelessness, right? Mm. Hopelessness in this very deep sense of people not having a sense that what they do matters, the kind of a loss of a sense of meaning in a certain way, coupled with that notion uh, that you bring up and that uh, Jim Gilligan has written so powerfully about, as you say, about the importance of a sense of humiliation and disrespect as being a, a big factor in why people are violent towards others. All of that, I think, comes into a, a mix which is really very destructive. I think we've been a little bit skittish about talking about that head on directly again, because there's always this fine line between acknowledging that that happens to some people under conditions of, of very severe oppression, uh, fine line between that understanding and kind of the stereotyping and stigmatizing of whole communities and saying that's kind of who they are. But to me, one of the exciting things to think about, and you mentioned this a minute ago, is uh, that if these are some of the social psychological processes that create violence, then you can think of ways of, of rechanneling it into something else, not of trying to convince people that, hey, hey, your life is really okay, what are you so angry about? But rather training people to take that anger and that sense of, of lack of hope, lack of meaning, and put some meaning into it and say, okay, let's, let's get you mobilized into challenging the structures that create this problem. It's a pretty old idea. You find it in all kinds of people. Kenneth Clark talked about this really, really eloquently. You can find it in, in people like Franz Fanon. Uh, also, clearly, I was going to spend some time talking about him in my book, but I... No, I please do. Please do. That's, <laughs> we have time. We have time. Go ahead. Whatever. I didn't, I didn't get a chance to talk about him in, in the book, but... Uh, but basically, uh, you know, he's, he's another person who really had this idea that people can transform uh, through collective action uh, against the uh, against the sources of their troubles. And but what was his but but what was his feelings too about violence? That some of it was justified, right? As yeah, he, he thought. So. Themselves? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, my own feeling, uh, I, Fanon is a really interesting, but also, I think, really rather problematic thinker in many ways. And if you if you say that some of his some of his uh, justification for the use of violence, he's talking about collective violence now, right? right. He's, he's saying uh, the people who the, the oppressed, you know, can indeed liberate themselves through through a collective violence to to demolish the structures uh, that are oppressing them. Unfortunately, I think if you take that position too far, you get things like the nature of the later history of Algeria, where he was doing this this work, and it's not pretty, uh, and it's not progressive, you know. Uh, yeah. And it went all it went crazy too among some of the white radicals in SDS, um, you know, weathermen, and so we've had. Mark Rudd on the show a couple of times, and he's come around to understand that as well. But um, yeah. how much, what is the role of the police again in all of this? And how, how much have we, have we become normalized to this, this approach to, um, to denying, in a sense, our, our structural racism? I mean, the hopelessness exists within the desperately poor black communities. That's evidenced also in uh, the enormous numbers of, of killings that go on in places like Chicago that you also documented. You might want to touch on that too. But it's also, there's a sort of uh, uh, despair, I think generally within the country that nothing much really happens or can happen. We have people like Reverend William Barber, who I very, very much respect and been working with. Mm -hmm. We've had Jonathan Wilson Hartgrove on a number of times in the show. So there are movements like that that are trying to restore the sort of hope that many of us had in the 60s. But it, it's sort of this still where we're struggling at so many different levels. Um, we just had a, a, an election. We, we uh, as you may or may not know, I've been 
was involved in the first protest and demonstration and trial uh, 10 years ago, protesting stop and frisk, which mm -hmm. began to change that narrative. Yeah. Uh, and yet we, I've also had Curtis Slew on the show and uh, he and, um, and our new mayor Adams are, are advocating a return to it, expansion of it. So it's, it's um, I know I'm throwing a lot at you here all at once here, but, but again, what is the role of the police? How come, what, the despair that the general culture has, the despair that that uh, the desperately poor black communities have, and movements like the Poor People's Campaign, which attempts through fusion politics to get us to um, work together um, to structurally, systemically change these things. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. It's a whole lot of stuff there. Okay. That's a, that's a whole lot of stuff, but but I think there's two basic questions in there. Correct yeah. me if I'm wrong, but one has to do with thinking about the role of the police specifically and what perhaps uh, what they might do or how we might how we might think about uh, a hopeful, if you will, vision of what public security ought to look like. The other is the question of of, of why the despair, why why this larger sense that that we're not able really to do anything about about these problems. Uh, let me speak to the first one of those things just for a minute first, kind of how to think about cops and their role in here. You know, one of the things I think that's wrong and one of the reasons why I think you see this sort of very rapid flipping of the pendulum back from immediate post-George Floyd to the present um, so that, uh, you know, you're now seeing this reemergence of a kind of relatively un, un, unmindful law and order sort of approach, which I think we see all over the place right now. But you, but you had this flipping, right? You had the flipping between defund the police right after George Floyd. And then the, you know, the polls do tell this story about how that declines very rapidly in the face of, of spiking homicide rates in particular uh, and other stuff. And then now you have the discourse simply falling conveniently into the into the other extreme. But I think it's really, really important to get beyond both of those extremes, uh, which I don't think either one of them helps us very much. And to step back and think about what's been the problem in the relationship between police and African-American communities in particular you know, for the course of our, our history as a country, really. And I think the thing that's most important to keep in mind is that there are two sides to that problem historically, right? Um, on the one hand, there's the abuse, uh, which is, you know, of course, what we highlighted after, after George Floyd's killing. That's been one part of it. Uh, abuse in the name of either this just kind of extraordinary harshness of our criminal legal system and also abuse in the name of enforcing a racial capitalist order. But the other side of that has always been the neglect. That is to say, not only the sort of active abuse of people living in those communities, but the withdrawal of concern on the part of public safety authorities for what happens to people who live there. Uh, the absence of protection against communal violence. And that's something, you know, I, I point this out in the book, that's something that a number of the early uh, scholars who went and looked very hard at relationships between white and black communities in the South in particular, that was one of the, the sort of central things that they saw, right? And on the one hand, you know, sure, cops and, and chain gangs and jailing black people at every chance you got. That was one side of the thing. But the other side of the problem was that nobody was protecting them against the really pretty inevitable communal violence that had boiled up, as one scholar put it, uh, as a result of the systematic oppression and the inability to fight that oppression in other ways. So anything we do, I think, has, uh, in terms of revisioning what we want police to do, has got to operate in that nexus. It's got to understand, yes, you absolutely have a police force that is respectful, uh, that doesn't abuse people, that is not some sort of occupying army, but it's we also have to take seriously our responsibility as a society, a larger society, to provide this elementary public function of public safety. Everybody gets to have that. 
Yeah. 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 Well, you know, I think that is, you know, you put your finger on what I think is sort of the question of the moment. Uh, are we going to be able to develop something like a homegrown American social democracy or not? But here's the thing, Jim, uh, and this I find very surprising. Uh, I believe very strongly that the the social policy initiatives that the Biden administration, surprisingly enough to some of us, uh, came out of the gate with once they got in office were that, right? They were steps, really important steps, almost unprecedented steps towards building that kind of American social democracy. This was a big deal. The original infrastructure bill, yeah. uh, the original version of this Build Back America thing, uh, is the way in which the Biden administration, the White House, seemed to be working hand in glove with Bernie Sanders and others with Bernie's uh, view of the world. I was thrilled, frankly, by what I saw, you know, actually being put on the table as serious legislative initiatives. And I think people need to keep that in mind. Of course, there's going to be enormous backlash against that. Because as you say, it's been defeated over and over again in American history. We've made kind of incremental changes periodically and we've gotten things over the time. We got the Medicare program. And you remember that if you look at the history of that, how, how enormously uh, that was resisted and how you know the idea that this is gonna make us into the Soviet Union if we, if we started giving healthcare to older people, right? Uh, that stuff is always going to be there. But what was really super exciting to me was how bold uh, the Biden administration had moved in the direction of, of a rather comprehensive view of this that tackled many of the pieces of a social democratic position all at once. And I thought that a, a lot of people, including a lot of liberals, kind of didn't get that. They didn't realize what had been put in front of them and they started focusing on the negatives, like, oh, you know, people, there are Democrats who don't like this, and the Republicans are going to fight it, and blah, blah, blah. Well, of course, of course. What do you expect? This is big stuff. This is really big stuff. And I remain, and this is, a, I'm finding it an increasingly isolated position, but I remain pretty optimistic about this, or pretty hopeful about it, um, in the sense that I've never seen as comprehensive a move toward social democracy in this country in my grown-up lifetime, as I've seen over this last year or so. No, I understand. Uh, I, I, I agree in part. But I think what Joe Biden needs to do is maybe channel a little bit of LBJ. And, and it, this is not happening through some sort of general consensus. of Right. It's not. So he's got to get tough, sometimes, again, just census to with the progressives of uh, AOC and so on, pushing uh, the the middle of the road and, 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 and helping them, I guess I would put it, maintain their backbone on this. I think that's what we really need also. I think we need to get tougher on this. I, I'm agreeing with you. It's there, but I don't, I'm not sure. I wish I was as optimistic as you. It seems like every day it's getting whittled down more and more and the backlash and so on and uh, compromise and compromise. But it's, it is something, yes. It is. And, and, and I think, you know, my own feeling, uh, uh, you, you know, I think you're not alone in, in, in feeling like maybe I'm a little over the top on this. All of my friends basically say, how come, you, you know, you must have some kind of genetic defect that you're so hopeful about this whole thing. But the way I put it is to think, to me, this is historic if we look at it in the long term. It really signals uh, a shift in what the mainstream, so to speak, of the Democratic Party is willing to think about and eager to think about doing. Right. I mean, man, we went, through, we went through a time when it was so hard to distinguish Democrats and Republicans. Remember that? That was kind of the good yeah. old days. Yeah. Now it's not hard, in part because the Republicans went crazy, but also partly because Democrats began finding uh, some backbone. 
and and in just a minute or two that we have because this is this has been a fabulous discussion i really appreciate this you you touch on the moral issue as as cornell west of radical love and um reverend barber uh fusion politics going back to a prophetic tradition um because in part this is a moral issue not left not right not democratic republican um and and blacks themselves people have been the most despised are the ones that are going to have to begin the healing process to help us ironically white america heal itself so the question is can we can we fuse that sense of, of our morality with a really articulate sort of vision of how do you translate that into a new kind of moral community? What does that mean in terms of the different yes. realms of life? Cops, you know, anti-poverty measures, the labor market, education, health care, because these we're are all part of the, Absolutely. We're, we're all part of the beloved community. As they would say, there we go. Listen, would you come back maybe six months from now? We, we will continue this conversation and see how things are at that point. I'd love to. And then I'd love to have you on. This has been a real treat. Thank you so very, very much. We've unfortunately run out of time. We're going over time. Thank you, Elliot, so very, very much. Thank you for all your work and, and your integrity and, and, and stands and activism. Thank you, Jim. It's been, it's been great talking. I look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, brother. And thank you. And thank you all for listening to us today on The Radical Imagination. This is Jim Fredos. We'll see you again next week on The Radical Imagination. The policy of stops and frisk the policy of stops and frisk is one of the most racist, the the most most racist, racist policies, in policies in the country. Policies in the country. Stop and frisk is the crime. Stop and frisk is the crime. Stop and frisk is the crime. Young people so precious. Young people of all colors, they so precious. We love them. We love them. We love them. We'll see you soon. See you soon. Where else? You got the message? You get the message across? Just say the young people, we love you. Can you please a little bit? You're cutting off this circulation, please. Ah! Ma'am, can you tell her your name? I'm sorry. Tell her your name. It's just the beginning. Next week in Brooklyn. Behind that, the South Bronx, back to East Harlem. We ain't stopping until we stop stopping Frick. My husband's a retired New York City police lieutenant, and he agrees with me. Stop and Frick has got to go. We say no to the new Jim Crow. Stop and Frick has got to go. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.